Did you know that there are three ways to murder your marriage? That's what we're looking at. The three ways to murder your marriage. And it's based on how investigators look at motive and means and opportunity. And people use the same in, in marriage. They, they, they come up with a means to, to divorce. They come up with, you know, a, a, the motive to divorce. They, they look for the opportunity to divorce. And we're asking the question, how do people trick other people into getting away with the murder of their marriage and making people feel that they're justified? They, they get away with murder. And we talked about this woman who divorced her husband by sabotaging the situation in that she deprived him sexually. He ends up committing adultery. She goes to the church leaders and she justifies a divorce on biblical grounds because you can divorce for adultery. And the truth was she wanted a relationship with another man, she told me, but no one knew that. Publicly, she claimed that her husband betrayed their romantic and sexual relationship. But did you know the weighty facts were against her as she was making her confession to me it became quite apparent. In the eyes of God, the scale actually tipped heavily in her disfavor. I want you to hear what Jesus said in Matthew 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. <laughs> I mean, that's picturesque. What, what's Jesus saying? Well, he's saying her husband committed a sin. He had that one night stand of adultery. But in comparison to her sin of neglecting justice and mercy and faithfulness and truthfulness and all the things that she was going on, I mean, his sin was the size of a gnat and her sin was the size of a camel. But she hid her camel-sized sin and fixated on what he did and trumpeted that before the elders and justified her biblical divorce. She accused her husband of that which she was far more guilty and this is a great trick when murdering a marriage. Whatever you do wrong, here's the, one of the tricks, accuse your spouse of this and worse, but work really hard at persuading yourself that you are fully justified for your actions or yours, your spouse is, is just a creep and <laughs> not justified. You see, these words of our Lord should have sobered this tricky gal when Jesus said, why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye but do not notice the log that is in your own eye. Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye, you hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Matthew 7. You see, this tricky wife proceeded headlong over the cliff. She knew that she would have the means financially to move forward with the divorce because of the division of the assets with her husband. She also knew that with no fault divorce, there would be no legal hassles. And to top it off, she had the support of her church leadership. I mean, she was also able to tout the irreconcilable differences by castigating her husband as unfaithful and, and said that, you know, he wouldn't be interested in reconciliation even if he suggested that he wanted that. She actually did kind of a PR campaign getting out in front of that, saying he'll tell you that he wants to reconcile, but I've lived with him. He was abusive. He abused me emotionally and verbally. Why did she do that? She knew the majority of women would buy her claim of abuse. Many women receive an immediate free pass with the word abuse. And what's interesting is I listened to her she rationalized her own verbal, emotional, sexual, and spiritual abuse of her husband. What do I mean verbal abuse? She lied about him to the elders, to family, to friends. He was a good-willed man who she deprived. She, she emotionally abused him. She shunned him emotionally, not to suggest humiliating him in front of the church. She sexually abused him by depriving him sexually, according to 1 Corinthians 7, 5. And she spiritually abused him by subjecting him to satanic attack. Remember, he says, let Satan tempt you because of your lack of self-control. And she spiritually abused him with the unjust accusation before the elders. And how did she rationalize this? And as we've said, rationalize is a rational lie, rational lies. Well, she, in part, I've seen women do this, and they, they fool themselves because she's the weaker vessel. Peter says women are the weaker vessel. 
And uh, she could never really be an abuser, sweet dewdrop that she is. She, she was a woman, and women do not abuse, not really. They're too sensitive, right? And in her favor, she had some facts. I mean, she painted the scene that at times he was, you know, angry and explosive, and, but she knew why. She was depriving him sexually. He knew she was up to something. I mean, the truth was she was having an affair. And of course, you know, she could take those snapshots and incriminate him even more. And he has to admit that, yeah, I, I exploded in angry. Now, I'm not letting abusers off the hook and not failing to empathize with the abuse. My dad verbally abused my mother and physically abused her by trying to strangle her. I want you to read my story elsewhere. I talk about the fact that I'm a wounded healer. My point here is to make sure that the real abuse is dealt with. My burden is that those who falsely claim abuse end up discrediting those who are truly abused. Anyone who is truly abused knows what I'm talking about and they agree with me. Those who truly suffered abuse look around and, and see people hijacking the word abuse, which minimizes their own after the liar is exposed. People then jump on the lie saying, see, much of this abuse stuff is all a fabrication. It, it disturbs me that those who co-opt abuse hurt the truly abused. Those in pain from years of abuse experience insult now added to their injury. Our tricky wife, after the facts surfaced, harmed the truly abused by cloaking herself in their garb and causing and casting a shadow of doubt on them. And let me say, I'm not letting men off the hook on this topic simply because I use this female as an illustration. The prophet Malachi hits the husband head on when he says, The Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth, against whom you have dealt treacherously, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Treacherously, the trickster, that man tricked and deceived and betrayed. So. As we wrap this up, what are the three ways to murder a marriage? One, possess a self-serving motive that you disguise from everyone except your lover if you have one. Make the case against your spouse as the one having impure motives while you take the stand in your own favor that you have nothing but goodwill and a desire for God's will. You are the victim, always. Make sure everyone knows that. But at the same time, I want you to memorize Isaiah 5.20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Secondly, look for the means of divorcing your spouse. As with this tricky wife, deprive your spouse of their emotional and sexual needs so they fall prey to those who have eyes full of adultery. Look at 2 Peter 2.14 sometimes. There are people praying about like this, eyes full of adultery. Never tell anyone about your little secret to entrap your mate. And also find a pastor or a biblical scholar who will allow you to divorce for essentially any reason whatsoever. And keep seeking a church that enables this. In fact, if you can find the pastor who will do your remarriage, hey, he's the perfect means of approval. Of course, as you proceed on this, I want you to keep Jesus in mind. What do I mean? Did you know that Jesus encountered such leaders and folks like you? I say this as your older brother. In, in Christ's day, people could divorce for almost any reason. Did you know that? There was more grace than law among the Jews on this point. We don't think about that. You see, but Jesus comes along and slams the door shut on that false teaching. He recognized the trickery that people twisted the Word of God for self-serving purposes. So as you deprive your spouse of sex, or you find a pastor who will tell you what you want to hear, memorize this phrase that Paul states in 1 Corinthians 9.21, the law of Christ, open quote, law of Christ, end quote. What law of Christ? What? What am I talking about? Jesus revealed that these sneaky and scheming tactics run contrary and counter to Abba Father's original intentions in Genesis. See, Jesus taught that narrow is the truth. Truth is always narrow. It's like the law of gravity. You know, the next time you jump out a window, you won't go up. You see, in shock, his disciples complained when he closed the door to divorce 
They said this, quote, if the relationship of the man with his wife is like this, it's better not to marry, Matthew 19.10. See, they heard Jesus say very clearly, once in, you can't get out. Not for all these scheming tricks that you all have. You're, you're trying to murder your marriage, but I've, I'm up to your game. But the disciples said, well, if we can't get out, then we're not getting in. And Jesus addresses that you've got to have gifts from God in order for that to happen. Jesus is saying, once in, you can't get out. And definitely not for treachery. See, too bad, as I think about it sometimes, that these self-serving people are not more self-serving. What do I mean? They should care enough to meet with Christ's disapproval as they turn their hearts to fulfill the law of Christ. In other words, there's coming a moment when we will stand before the Lord. And if you really care about yourself, you won't play these kinds of games. But as Galatians 6.2 says, you will fulfill the law of Christ. And there's a third way to murder your marriage. Look for the opportunity to exit the marriage and enter another relationship. But do so prudently. Begin by saying, I need some space. I mean, I've been through this script so many times, folks, it's unbelievable to me. First thing, I need, we need space. And then, then you turn that into, you know, I, I think to help our marriage, one of us needs to move out for a while. This will allow us to, to work on ourselves and, and then the marriage. And then while away, meet with your lover. Get on the internet and learn what others have done in your situation. I will tell you, there is a script out there that everyone follows. It's predictable. Every time I can smell it out early on. Then contact the divorce lawyer who knows the script. And, hey, by the way, if someone asks you if there's a lover, deny it, deny it, deny it, deny it. You've already lied, so now just seal it. Just become that good liar that you've already begun to be. I've been through this so many times, people look right at me, no, there's no one, there's no one, and it comes out again and again and again, it's lying right through their teeth. So you gotta be good at it to murder your marriage. And if a spouse gets wind of the affair, viciously, and here's what is very important, viciously attack them as a wicked snoop, invading your privacy, which now reinforces to you why this marriage won't work. I've been through this so many times, it's a script. I don't know who's given you the script, but it's not the spirit of Christ, probably a different spirit. Besides, you can tell if it comes out, this other person isn't your lover, they're just a friend. As you proceed, I suggest another scripture to memorize though. Hebrews 13, 4. Marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled. For fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Truth is, it doesn't make any difference what the law of the land says. The Lord doesn't change. He doesn't change. You know, years ago, there was a battleship straight forward through the open seas. And it saw this light coming at them and demanded that that light get out of the way, that that other move. And this light voice back, you know, you move. And the captain of the ship says, you move. And the, finally, the other guy says, you move. I'm a lighthouse. <laughs> A battleship is not going to defeat that land and that cliff. You're not going to be able to commit adultery and somehow say, God, your law must change. No, the law of Christ won't change. And here's the deal. When God judges you, why does he do that? Because he hates you? Absolutely not. God loves you so much that he accepts you unconditionally just the way you are in all of your messed up life. Very important that you hear me on that point. But God loves you too much to allow you to remain in that condition. And therefore, when he says he judges you, it means he disciplines you. He loves you that much. Well, let me ask you this. Are you committed to murder in your marriage? Do you have the motive, the means, and the opportunity? The question on the table is, are you going to use them? Or will you be another kind of person that I contrast in this way, who has the motive to do the will of God, in the marriage, who uses the means of grace given by God to husbands and wives to love and respect unto Christ, and who sees the trials in the marriage as God's opportunity to grow. We might say these are the three ways to resurrect it, a murdered marriage or an attempted murder, but that's a blog for another time. For now, don't get away with murder.